Hi, I'm Megan Johnson. This is Young Entrepreneurs Profit versus Pitfalls. I am so excited. A month ago, I spoke for the American Association of Equine Practitioners. Basically, that's horse veterinarians. And I met my following guest, Sherry Johnson. She was so nice. She spent time with me prior to my presentation, talked to me about her practice, and I was just dumbfounded. She is a millennial. She is also a woman in a male-dominated industry. She's a practice owner. She owns her own practice, she and her partner. Her resume re truly reads like some kind of overachiever handbook. And we were just chatting, not only does she own her own practice, not only she's about to celebrate her wedding anniversary, but she's also getting her PhD. So Sherry, it's so great to see you virtually, but it is so fun to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Megan. I've been excited about this podcast for like weeks now. So oh, well, thank you. we did have a little technical difficulty about a week ago. Sherry was ready to go, but sadly our technology wasn't. But uh, thank you for coming back. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Tell me a little bit about the journey that you went from being a veterinarian, entering this male-dominated world, and I realize that there are more women vets than before, but really the vet the vet being a veterinarian is very very male dominated you you become a veterinarian and you are now you and your partners own your own practice can you, you walk us through that journey yeah i i love you know telling people about my journey and how i arrived at my passion for veterinary medicine and i do think it's noteworthy just to say that um you know i am an equine sports medicine and rehab specialist so that's pretty much my only area of focus so i don't work on dogs cats anything else except horses um, and even more specialized within the equine field i work on orthopedic injuries so orthopedic rehab sports medicine type of cases so i'm a bit skewed in terms of um you know i'm not necessarily representative of the the average veterinarian out there and the veterinary field at this point in time is about 70, 80 percent um, female, you know, women coming through veterinary school. But it wasn't always like that. And I've been a veterinarian for 10 years now, um, you know, and, and I would say when I went to veterinary school 10 years ago that, you know, there was definitely more um, women in the student body. But historically, the field of veterinary medicine has always been very male dominated and specifically equine sports medicine has been you know, that specific field has been very male dominated as well. And when I first started um, my residency, so I did my veterinary school at Iowa State University, graduated in 2012, um, did an internship, finished my residency at Colorado State University, and then got board certified. And I was actually trained um, predominantly by men, but I also had some really amazing women in my, in my court as well that mentored me through that process. Um, and I think the, the major important thing to note was that, you know, the men and the women that I worked with, they always supported me in every way possible. And, you know, I really wasn't raised that women should or could be doing anything necessarily differently than men. Like I was raised, like, if you want something, go after it and get it and work hard for it. Um, and my mentors definitely resonated with that mantra as well. And so when I started my residency, it was a collaborative residency through Colorado State University and what was then the private practice equine sports medicine LLC, which my partners and I now own. So I did my training through them, got done with my residency and then ended up buying into the practice. And um, my partner, Dr. Josh and Cameron Donnell, uh, we actually bought out all of the, the partners there. So, but the two partners of the practice at the time through my residency training, um, they will giggle if they listen to this, they're old white guys, you know, <laughs> and I was the first, you know, more permanent female veterinarian um, of the practice or on the trailer, as we say. So we have a, a mobile unit, it's a modified NASCAR trailer that travels the quarter horse circuit. Um, and I was the, the first female veterinarian, you know, to be a bit more of a permanent fixture on that trailer. and. Um, so that was super exciting. That is, that sounds amazing. What, um, what motivated you and your partners to buy out the, to use your language, the, the old white guys? What, what motivated oh you, what, what, what motivated you to, to decide to buy them out? 
Well, I think it was, it's all timing. And I think as you're a young professional, you know, those little, those subtle things that happen along your journey or along the way, um, I really do think that the timing is everything and, and being open to what those opportunities are at the time that they present themselves. So I got done with my residency. Um, Josh was already board certified, already, you know, working horse shows and, and working for the practice. And it was fairly casual, but, you know, he kind of approached me and said, hey, do you want to buy this? Like, I think we could grow this. I think we could make it successful and, you know, kind of give it a facelift. Not that it was um, that needed a facelift, mm -hmm. but there was definitely a changing of the guards feel to things. Mm -hmm. And Josh and I are both very different in our styles of practice, how we approach cases. You know, our staff kind of giggles because they say, well, you two end up medically a lot of times at the same place for certain cases, but you go about it very differently. And I actually think that that difference in the two of us has, has what's helped generate a lot of the success that we have had. And Josh's wife, Dr. Cameron, uh, Cameron Stout, Cameron Donnell, um, you know, she had she brings a different perspective even to the practice than Josh and I. And so we have, you know, the three partner veterinarians that are all very good, but at different things. And we tend to gravitate towards certain clientele in certain cases. And I ultimately think that's one of the strengths of our practice is, you know, if you don't resonate with my style, most likely you're going to resonate with Cameron's style or Josh's style. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real benefit of business. Um, but you know, it was just, it was fairly casual. I got done with my residency, kind of looked around like, well, you know, what's the next step. And it was at the time that I had also transitioned into a PhD at Colorado state university, focusing specifically on orthopedic rehabilitation strategies. And people might think that sounds crazy. And most days I also think that that's crazy. <laughs> Um, but the reality is that those two jobs, they actually go quite hand in hand. One does fuel the other in terms of, you know, the clinical inspiration of working on the horses and kind of in the trenches in Texas and at the horse shows. That's what has completely inspired my PhD research. So the two go very much hand in hand. Um, so it's, it's a really, it's fun to be a hybrid, you know, kind of of the academic world and the private practice world. I would say my experience in um, researching how younger people approach work and approach problem solving, that what you're saying is, I think, a wonderful attribute of many young people is that they say, you know, I don't have to be just pigeonholed into this one area that I can take, take things from different areas and, and, and combine them. Um, yeah. and it's not just one path to get, you know, just one path to get from point A to point B, but there's a variety of paths. Yeah. And I think if I had any advice, you know, for young, especially females out there, you know, up against something difficult, right? Like you're going to find people that are going to give you a million reasons why an idea is bad, why it won't work, how it's going to fail. And you just have to keep going. You just have to push through. And the reality is, is that my job, my position right now of managing a high volume, privately owned, board certified, owned and operated rehab center, that job didn't exist five years ago. That, that wasn't a job title that anyone in the veterinary industry had, but that's what I wanted to do. And I set my, I set my mind to it that that's what I was going to do. Like all, you know, most of the time I wanted to just be overseeing really difficult rehab cases to make a difference. And push the needle forward in terms of rehab strategies. Like it's not just about resting and icing things anymore. Like let's do something different, think outside of the box. And so it, it wasn't an easy path by any means. It was super difficult. And every single day sometimes continues to be difficult. I'm up against a hard case or, you know, another rejection from a grant submission or whatever. Um, but you just got to keep, keep going and have that support system around you that is going to help, help, um, you know, inspire you along the way. Well, so now I was not aware that, so the, the position or the title that you hold now, it, it didn't exist five years ago is what I heard you say. Yeah. And what I mean by that, Megan, is that for a veterinarian to spend the bulk of their time professionally focused on rehab itself is not a common position to have. You know, usually if a veterinarian 
is affiliated with a rehab center or kind of has a rehab center, they're also seeing cases um, and not, you know, specifically dedicated, focused on the rehab care of those horses. So my goal was to become the highest evolution of the species. I wanted to be not only board certified, but residency trained in rehab. And I got that training at Colorado State University. It was fabulous. Um, and the orthopedic research center there, you know, now kind of morphed into the translational medical institute. That's really the grand poobah of where this orthopedic training originated. So I sought out, you know, the very best program in the whole world, um, the collaborative residency that I completed. I wanted it to be the highest volume on specific Western performance horses. And then I've taken that training, you know, one step further and morphed it into what is now our business and our practice and really have just focused on um, rehabbing the equine athlete. And, so, and your part, and you mentioned your partner, your partner is a married couple? Yes. Okay. And I didn't well, realize. three of us. Total. Well, that's, yep. that has to be an interesting dynamic. So you, <laughs> you, it's you and the other two veterinarians are, are married. How, how does that play out? Yeah. So that's actually a great question. Uh, so Cameron and I, we like to call ourselves, you know, Joshua's sister wives. And <laughs> everyone always thinks like, everyone always thinks that it's that I'm probably going to be on the island and then Josh and Cameron, you know, like ganged up against me. But the reality is it's usually Cameron and I against Josh. So I'm actually, I'm not sure that that was the smartest business move that he ever made was uh -huh. getting into business with his wife and myself. But here we are. <laughs> um, but I'm saying all of this, like, you know, I, I adore my partners. We have a great working dynamic. Like I said, we are we go at things differently. We work together. We support each other. Um, there's so many times where I have to run things by Cameron or Josh, like cases that are weird. We're always collaborating. We're always talking. Um, and it's really, truly a great dynamic. And I think, you know, any young veterinarians listening to this is like, find your people, find your village, find the people that maybe they think you're crazy and your ideas are crazy, but they're willing to go that direction as well with you. And that's probably the neatest thing I could say about Josh is like, he's truly a visionary um, and he's a dreamer. And so I have these ideas and Cameron has ideas as well. Like I consider my ideas to be scary and big and somewhat impossible, right? Mm -hmm. Like to get to where we are now, like if you would have told me, you know, three or four years ago that this is where we were going to be at, I would have never believed you. Um, but Josh, for whatever reason, and Cameron too, like they've, they've believed in me, they've believed in us, and they've believed in our common vision, and they've just helped make it happen. And so I think, you know, as you're going through things, the, the people that tell you no and shoot down your idea, give you the million reasons why it's not going to work, those are probably not your people. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need a yes man, but you need people who are, are going to really help you pull the wagon in the same direction and all be on the same team together. And our staff is amazing. We have the best staff in the in entire world. We certainly couldn't have done any of this, you know, or do any of this day to day without their help and support there. I always tell people, I'm like, they're really the ones that know what's going on around here. <laughs> so. Did you find that most when the, when the transition happened from the previous owners to you and, and Josh and Cameron, did I say their names right, Josh and Cameron? When yep. when that transition happened, did a, most of the staff stay on or did you have to do a little cleaning house there? You know, there was a little cleaning house. Um, and I think as as we look over the last few years about staff members that didn't weren't necessarily a fit for our practice, um, those those differences usually become pretty apparent, you know, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think I have as I've, as I've grown and gotten more experience, I've become more comfortable with just accepting that this might not be a fit for, for the staff member, for our practice, for whatever the reason may be. And the reality is, is if you have people that are happy and love doing what they're doing and they love doing it with you, like a supportive, positive type of environment, they're going to do such a better job. So our goal is to, you know, no need is left unmet for our horses. They get every single thing, every single detail of their program has to be on point for the, the best outcome possible. The reality is it's not me doing that every single day. It's our, it's our staff. So that support network um, has been just integral to helping us grow. 
And it's interesting, you know, because we, we want to change things. We want to do things differently. And I think, you know, change can be met with with some pushback and some resistance. But I would say in general, our our staff has been, you know, fully supportive of that. Um, and a lot of times they come up with ideas that I hadn't thought of and ways we should go about things in terms of efficiency and um, and all of that. So it's it's been a real learning experience, you know, managing people. Um, you know, Josh does much more of the business end of things than I do, but we still kind of each have our own core group of people that we that we work with and manage. So it's it's been a ride. <laughs> no pun intended. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I kind of want to jump back on the staff because, as you know, I speak to different groups about generations and kind of a, a, a common common complaint people have is that um, it's hard to find staff, especially, you know, younger people, but it's hard to find staff that is that will engage in what could be considered uh, like hard work or maybe um, I, I don't like to use the word dirty, but because but I mean, you know, you, if you're working with horses, yeah. if you're working with horses, you're not sitting in a, a in a, an office, a pristine office, you know, you're going to have you're going to have some interaction. Right. Right. And so uh, how do you how do you find the right people to work in what I consider a non-traditional environment like that? Yeah, it it's a struggle. I mean, and I'm going to be honest, it's not like everything is rainbows and butterflies in terms of hiring staff and retaining that staff. Um, but I think the leadership roles that we've really worked on, you know, in our within ourselves, like me, Josh, and Cameron, the leadership skills um, to help motivate and to help inspire our staff members to really do the best job possible has been the best thing. And I think some things that I've found along the way, like it's never a reason to to have a staff member do something a certain way, you know, and I, I said so kind of thing because I said so is never a good enough reason. You have to be able to back it up with, here's the reasons why I want you to do this, this, and this in this specific way or this specific order. Um, so I think that is really important is getting them to, you know, fully engage and understand in the why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and then I think once they they get behind that, that message and that overall theory on thing, it, it becomes a lot easier to get passionate about the work. And the second thing is there's, you know, we're we're never above any job. I might be in the barn sweeping the floor you know, at mm -hmm. 6 p.m. just with my staff or working with the naughty horses or doing the jobs that no one else wants to do. Uh -huh. So I think that's a really important thing is to stay in tune with your staff and, and just let them know that you are um, there for them as well. And specifically my rehab staff members, like we have little check-in meetings, like how are things going? And it's a one-on-one -on -one, um, confidential conversation that happens of like, are you happy? Mm -hmm. If you're not happy, you know, why is that? How can I help you um, succeed in this role? Where do you want to be? What are your goals? And so I really do try to take the time. And each individual staff member is is really important. And the good ones, like we try to take care of them, you know, really, really well and, and keep them happy in doing what um, what they're great at, which is helping manage our horses and working with our horses. So I think that's been you know, if you don't have good staff and the, the people on the ground working with whatever your product may be, like my product is rehabbing horses, but whatever your product is, like mm -hmm. if you don't have people there that care um, and are, are really wanting to do a good job, the whole thing's going to be a struggle. And I know that from experience of having gone through iterations of staff members that didn't work out. Mm -hmm. um, so cut bait earlier rather than later, I guess. is my, <laughs> Cut my bait advice. earlier, is that what you said? Yeah, if yes. something's not working out, like yeah. Yeah. it's not a fit, you yeah. know, don't beat yourself up and move on. But the your core village of people that are there take really good care of them mm -hmm. because they they are your they're helping create your final product and they're so important to your business. Yeah, I I, I like what you said about cut bait earlier because I have had several people work in my office, and I it, and they're not you know I I realized early on they're not a good fit. But I keep trying to make it so it's a good fit for them. You know, do this, do that, it, and it, it. And so when I finally just say, you know, this isn't working, we need to go our separate ways. It's this huge relief, and I think to myself, if I'd only yeah. done this a couple months ago, I would have saved myself so much time. 
Absolutely. And I think, you know, the people that are really your core village that are doing the great job and really putting everything they have into, into your dream and what you're doing, when they do come to you with a problem or a suggestion, mm -hmm. my experience has been is that it's usually really thought out and very logical and backed by reasons, mm -hmm. you know, of like, this isn't working, we need to do X, Y, Z. So right. I think, but if you have that that experience of it's not going well and it's not a good fit initially, you know, it is really hard to put a round peg in a square hole situation. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be able to identify who are those key stakeholders. I, I need to listen to this feedback or this feedback isn't helpful. That's never going to change. That's not possible, yeah. you know, sort of situation. So. Well, and I want to talk a little bit more about when you and Josh and Cameron did take the business over. Did you have any pushback from the clients? The, that was, continues to be interesting experiences. You know, horse people are real funny. Uh -huh. um, their horses are their babies mm -hmm. and whoever is going to be taking care of their, their horse and as part of their program, that's a, that's a really delicate thing. And it's not just a flyby decision, right? Of like, this is a casual, oh, now you're my vet. When, you know, Alan, Don Allen, Dave Frisbee had started this practice they were the foundational partners that built it to what it was so that Josh and I could then take it and be successful, right? But they had in turn built this clientele that loved them and cherished them. And they were like, you know, friends and family. Mm -hmm. And so it was a lot easier for, I think, Josh to break into that culture because he had been around, he's actually Alan's nephew. So he had been around these people almost his entire life. So they knew Josh, Josh was familiar, but I was the new kid on the block and I hadn't necessarily grown up in this circle. I'd grown up with horses and riding horses, but I hadn't grown up with the super fancy Western performance horses that, you know, I was now being expected to work on. Mm -hmm. And there was a really big struggle for me, especially initially because I was a woman and the veterinarians had always been male and the technicians had always been young female <laughs> and you know i'm 30 just turned 37 years old and i get told all the time that i look young and i say well thank you my moisturizer is doing its job then <laughs> um but that was a real struggle for me was to establish myself as just even a veterinarian they didn't understand that i was the veterinarian or how how was i able to communicate that message other than just having the conversations with them and you know letting my work speak for itself and slowly over time, you know, Alan and Dave were very supportive and, and they helped promote Josh and I to the client, right? Of like, these guys are gonna take excellent care of you. You couldn't be in better hands. And I was trained by them. Mm -hmm. I was a therefore product or an extension of them, which they also took a lot of pride in. So I think that having that healthy relationship there is, is really important. Like I, I talked to some veterinarians where the mentorship piece, it doesn't necessarily flow and they're not necessarily portrayed as being an equal or coming in and taking over the reins. Like it's kind of awkward or it's weird, but it never was for Josh or I. I mean, Dave and Alan were always really supportive of that transition. But I, I do giggle because, you know, women um, were were and continue to be some of the more difficult clients to convince them that I'm competent, even though I might look young and even though I'm a woman and I'm different than Dave or Alan, which I, I think is a, is very, it's always an interesting dynamic. Like within the past month, I had an older woman come up to me at a horse show, you know, a trainer. And she said, do the guys really let you work these horse shows by yourselves? Like, you <laughs> know, cause let it was you? me and, uh, <laughs> Me and another uh, another female veterinarian, one of our residents, and then a female technician. And I just, like, I looked at her and I, you know, I don't know that my response is necessarily like PC for this <laughs> podcast, but, but that's an example. Like, uh -huh. women can be the most difficult for me to work with sometimes. Um, and everyone would always think, like, you know, I deal with the crying cowboys. Like, <laughs> that's not a problem. That's fine. It's, you know, a lot of times it's the women that um, are the, the tougher sell. And, yeah. you know, there's certainly been plenty of them along the way mm -hmm. that have been, that have mentored me. And, you know, I'm not the first woman ever to experience pushback of being a woman. Mm -hmm. Females have been fighting that for decades, right? 
but I think it's just all in how you handle it. And at the end of the day, if you are consistent and you deliver results and you care, I think is the biggest thing, um, then you will build that culture that is like you. Um, so whatever your business is, like you're gonna gravitate towards like-minded people. Mm -hmm. And I have some of the very best clients in the world. Cameron thinks her clients are the actual best. I think mine are the best and Josh thinks that his are the best. So. You know, each personality style is different and, and how you how you interact with your clients, but it, it really does become a very personal relationship. And do the do the clients come to you or do you spend more of your time going out to people's uh, to to people's barns or do they, or do they yeah, come to you? So I, you know, I'm fairly unique in the fact that really the only times that I'm out seeing cases is when our mobile unit goes to horse shows. So I serve, our practice serves as the official AQHA World Show veterinarian. Um, so we're the official, you know, veterinarian at all of those horse shows, the youth world, the select world, and then the open world championships. And then we go to several other horse shows, you know, throughout the season as well. Mm -hmm. But we have this modified NASCAR trailer. It's a souped up um, basically a mobile vet clinic for horses that Alan and Dave built back in the day and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and we travel around the country and we support, you know, the AQHA horse shows. We're kind of like the carnies, but for veterinarians <laughs> a little bit. Um, so I spend, you know, some of my time is spent doing that. We mm -hmm. do fund a residency program um, through Colorado State University. So we have two residents that spend time with Josh and myself directly getting trained in these sports medicine cases. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a, it's, it's a really interesting caseload. It's super high volume, it's super high pressure because these horses are all very expensive. Mm -hmm. They're all at horse shows, they're looking to compete or a big competition is on the line. Um, and, or it's, you know, people hauling their horses into the horse show for us to look at them because pretty much all we do is sports medicine. Okay. You know, we're not really spending a lot of time like vaccinating or doing teeth. Like we're very, very specialized. So I'll see cases out on the road. Um, and then we have our home rehab center that's in Whitesboro, Texas. And, you know, we have usually between 40 and 50 horses at that rehab center that, um, I manage the care with my staff, um, from the ground all the way up. So when I'm not at horse shows, I'm typically hiding <laughs> with my rehab <laughs> horses um, wow. and and working on them exclusively. So Josh and Cameron do see cases out of the home clinic that's in mm -hmm. Pilot Point. It's about 30 minutes away. Um, the clinic is, you know, is high volume as well. Um, but I'm pretty much the one that's, you know, thinking, looking at the rehab horses and, and managing their care. So it's a it's a pretty fun dynamic. And when you say high volume, what does that translate into? So in the year of 2021, our practice looked at 22,000 horses. Oh my gosh. Um, mm -hmm. wow. Meaning we're busy all yeah. the time. You know, we've got horses coming and going. Um, and that's a really big deal to us. I mean, mm -hmm. being able to affect a horse's recovery is huge. And, and people listening to this who are not horse people might just think, well, you know, horses are a luxury item. Not necessarily. A lot of times these horses are, you know, I have several clients that have physical disabilities or physical limitations themselves. And their horse is integral to them maintaining strength or is actually a part of their PT program at home. So they have a tie, they have a connection, they have a need for that horse. And if that specific horse is injured or not able to, to help on their journey to the recovery, then they actually suffer as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a variety of levels. It's a lot of different cases that we see. Um, every single one of these horses is different. Mm -hmm. um, they're different in terms of their behavior, their personality, who they prefer to work with, um, and really diving into those nuances to manage them like to the best level possible mm -hmm. is like my favorite thing about my job. Yeah. But getting those cases in the door, right, that people want to give up on and they say, well, nothing else is going to work and nothing has worked and this is doom and gloom. And we come in and we try to rebuild the machine as much as possible. And I don't always win, but I do win a lot. <laughs> and I like to try to, you know, under promise and over deliver. That's my mantra. I can't assure you that your horse will have a good or outcome, but I can promise you that I will do everything in my power to make sure it has the best outcome possible. Oh. Um, so I get 
just really, really passionate about talking about these horses. They mean the world to me when they're there. They are, I treat them as if they were my own horse. And people ask me, well, do you have your own horses? I'm like, no, <laughs> I have like 40 to 60 horses that I'm managing at all times, trying to, you know, keep everything happy and healthy. But, um, but it's fun. I, I mean, I, I'm literally living my dream. I couldn't ask for a, a better job in life. It's really, I don't view it as my job. It's, it's what I love. And um, I decided that this was going to be, you know, my gift to the world was to, to help horses. And on the PhD research side of things, you know, this, this research that we're doing is directly, you know, applicable to what human physical therapists are doing. So then that's a whole other aspect as well, that indirectly my, my research on horses, I think it will end up helping um, a tremendous amount of humans as well. So that's also really important. It's well, it's incredible. I think the horse, the horse human bond is amazing. And I know that we spoke before and I used to ride horses when I was a kid. And it's just, it's one of those things that just, it's, horses are truly they're just incredible creatures and as you said much like humans they have personalities of people they want to deal with people they don't want to deal with but I have to ask when you said earlier about naughty horses you you deal with the naughty horses what what how does how does a horse get into the naughty category oh a variety of ways a variety of ways so um you know naughty horses can be naughty for a variety of reasons um but it's mostly you know just coming from the behavioral aspect you have to remember that we're dealing with injured horses so they're in pain mm -hmm. they're usually pissed off at the world for a variety of reasons because of this pain and most of them are on restricted exercise so they don't have an outlet that's safe for them mm -hmm. you know to blow off steam like like other normal horses do so they may have developed certain vices. They may have developed certain aversions to touching certain areas or doing certain things or just in general, horses are unpredictable. Um, so they can also just like, you know, rip their bandages off or rip up their blanket, you know, just like be naughty or just kind of throw me a curveball in terms of like, you know, you had that you're this far out from surgery, you should be this sound, but you're not, you're mm -hmm. still limping. You know, those non-responders um, are difficult to predict. And I sit and I spend hours thinking about each one of these cases and um, contemplating, you know, what I need to do to get their best recovery. I do consults all the time. I have an, an arsenal of equine radiologists that I use, Dr. Myra Barrett, my shout out, she's my equine radiologist exclusively that, that reads all of my studies for me and is in large part um, one of my mentors and, and has been just a tremendous role model um, through my path. So I consult with her all the time. You know, I have several surgeons that I work with as well that always bouncing ideas off of um, and trying to think about things differently. And, the folks at Owens Recovery Science and also Delphi Medical Innovations have been key to um, helping with my blood flow restriction passion and my PhD work there in terms of bringing that to um, the equine athlete. Oh, and I love that phrase. You've, you've, you said it to me earlier when we, when we spoke a couple months ago, e the equine athlete. I absolutely love that phrase. Yeah. Well, they are. They it, are the Michael Jordans of the horse world. It's you amazing. Know, you take care of them. When I was young and I first uh, got my, my first horse, uh, the, the, this grizzled old stable guy said to me, you're not a true horse person until you've been kicked, bit, and thrown. <laughs> and I remember so the ten, my 10-year-old self thought, oh no, that's not going to yeah. happen to me. I think it all happened to me like within the first you know, 14 days. So <laughs> yeah, I tell people they're dangerous at each end and like dicey in between. So <laughs> Very true. I, you know, life choices they're not super into making good life choices sometimes like yeah. this is why we can't have nice things like you know not every day is a 10 in rehab i tell people that you gotta stay the course and don't get focused on the dips okay. or the, the peaks um, because that's probably about to change yeah. but the horsemanship piece of what we do is so important like understanding these horses and um and figuring out how to best work with them and what makes them happy and center their chi that's half the battle yeah. um it's just the horsemanship piece and that's where you know my staff is amazing i have amazing horsemen that work with me um 
in these horses. And a lot of times if we're struggling on one certain thing between all of us in the barn, we can usually come up with a, with a good game plan to manage those guys. But oh, they, um, I was so honored to work with this year's AQHA super horse. So the 2021 super horse, she's one of my favorite horses of all time. Snap it, send it. I've got to give her a shout out. Um, she is just one of my, you know, personal favorite athletes of all time. And what's the horse's name again? Snap it, send it. Snap it, send it. Yep. Oh, yep. So she's think... owned by Kent Ray Taylor and, and trained by Blake Wise out of KRT Show Horses. Um, yep. And you want to talk about equine athlete? She is the definition of it. Oh. So I'm gonna. Interestingly yeah. enough, her the mayor that that horse is out of is the the she herself was also a super horse and she is the first horse in history to go on to produce another super horse. Oh, so really? That's also very And what's, cool. snap it, send it. What's her mother's name? Snap, crackle, pop. <laughs> I see a theme here. Yes, Excellent. they're amazing, amazing Excellent. athletes. Well, I, you know, Sherry, I, I had a whole list of things I wanted to talk to you about, but this has just been great. We didn't even touch the list because everything you had to say was just, I wanted to hear more of what you had to say. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, if people wanted to find you on social media or get in touch, how would they do that? Yeah, we are on Facebook and Instagram. Our Instagram is at Equine Sports Medicine, E-S-M. So it's all spelled out. And yes, there's two E's in a row. Um, and it's the picture of the big blue truck. Um, we also have a website, um, www.eqsmr.com. And you can reach us directly by emailing um, rehab at equine-sportsmedicine.com. Oh, perfect. And then again, I've been on your website. I've seen some of the images. They are really, if, even if you're not a horse person, you should go look at these images. They're just the pictures of the animals you have and the work you're doing is truly, it's incredible. And I want, as a horse person, I want to thank you for everything you've doing and, and your, you oh, and your partners. Thank you for having Thank you for having me. This has been a tremendous honor, Megan. Oh. And thank you for speaking at our convention this year. Oh, it was, oh. That was, that was a highlight. And um, for those of you listening, Megan totally called me out and showed a picture of me. And I, I was there, I was <laughs> backstage. But she, she asked me to like stand up in the audience and then awkwardly I wasn't there. Yeah. But I was backstage. I was there. I was prepping. Yeah, for my I, was, I was looking out there. I'm like, where's Sherry? Where's Sherry? I'm like, oh, Kexi, she ditched me. <laughs> <laughs> but oh. Yeah, thank you so much. We loved having you. It was, oh. a, it was a great talk. Well, thank you again. It was my honor to speak for, for the association. And I, it, when I got to interview you and several of your other peers, it was just, it, it made it a really a, a wonderful experience. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. So we just finished talking to Sherry Johnson with Equine Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation. She takes care of those big, beautiful animals, horses that really have, um, we've had a bond with horses for many, 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 many years. Um, please check her out. And I look forward to seeing everybody very soon when we talk to more young entrepreneurs about their profits and pitfalls. Bye. <laughs>